So welcome. Uh, my name is Jonathan Irish. I'm a head and neck surgeon at the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre in Toronto, Canada. And I've been asked to interview one of the iconic leaders of our head and neck surgery specialty. And joining me is Dr. Patrick Ghislaine. Pat, uh, uh, Pat is everything in head and neck surgery. He's done everything in head and neck surgery. Pat has been the uh, previous president of the American Head and Neck Society. He's been previous chair of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Toronto, the previous chief of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery and uh, chief of the Head and Neck Surgery Service at the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre and the University Health Network. And in that capacity, he has uh, achieved uh, so many awards that uh, I don't have time to list them. He has uh, been uh, awarded the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, some of the most prestigious awards that a civilian can receive in Canada and in the province of Ontario. So what I'm going to do today is ask Pat a few questions uh, to get uh, a background on the history of he American head and neck uh, surgery, Canadian head and neck surgery, and Pat's perspective on the past, the present, and the future. So Pat, uh, welcome. So Thank you, John. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor to interview you. Uh, I was a student of Pat's, by the way. I was his fellow, and I've been a colleague. We're working with Pat for 25 years, so I know Pat pretty well. But uh, Pat, why don't you give us a thumbnail sketch of uh, where you've come from up until you started head and neck uh, surgery, uh, let's say uh, uh, to the present day, but uh, why don't you give, you, uh, give us a little bit of background? Okay, well I'm very privileged and honored to have uh, John interview me for this uh, prestigious interview. Uh, John was uh, one of the preeminent uh, fellows and students that I've had over the past uh, 30 years. I knew that he was going to be incredibly successful, and I think all of you know that he has been very successful. And it is, it is uh, with pride and honor that I'm here this afternoon to address any questions that John has uh, for me. Well, very brief briefly, I was uh, born on the west coast of Ireland uh, in a little place called Ballinasloe, a population of about uh, 6,000 people. I, uh, my mum was a, in business and uh, hotel business, my dad was in construction. And there was, uh, I was fortunate that uh, both parents did work. And at that time, many females did not work, but I was fortunate to have a mother who was very uh, ambitious and certainly supported any of our dreams. Uh, I, uh, once I finished high school in Ballinasloe, I uh, went to uh, the University in Galway, which is on the west coast of Ireland, and I always had a dream to do uh, medicine. But it all started because my dad was in the construction uh, business, uh, was building a hospital when I was about 10 years of age, built another hospital when I was about 12, and I was uh, given the opportunity to see the inside of a new hospital, and in particular an operating room. And I said, I want to be a surgeon. I was about 12. And one of the uh, surgeons in that uh, hospital was uh, a friend of my dad, and knew my dad very well, and he said, well, let's uh, see what happens. Well, I eventually uh, did go forward and go into med school, finish med school uh, in 1970. But during those uh, six, uh, five or six years in medical school, five years, uh, pre-med, one year, five years following that, I spent some time in my hometown and uh, the chief of surgery in my hometown in this little hospital called Pertziankla was the person who was instrumental in my dream to get to see an operating room when I was 12 and he said, come and scrub with me. And at that time I was about a second year medical student and uh, I, every opportunity I got I went to, to this little hospital uh, when I was on home on vacation and um, uh, scrubbing in was was unique. It was just absolutely unique. Very exciting. And he was doing this case uh, one day, a parotid tumor. 
and he couldn't find the facial nerve. I'd gone and looked at it and knew where the facial nerve was, but he did as well, just couldn't find it. And he turned to me and he said, Pat, he said, uh, why don't you uh, do head and neck uh, surgery and come back and join me in this uh, hospital? So that was uh, one of the uh, things that really triggered my interest in head and neck. And number two, John, I uh, loved anatomy. As a first and second year medical student, I had an exposure to anatomy. And I was given a project, which I alluded to in the Hayes Martin lecture uh, two years ago, that uh, I was all about neck dissection. And uh, I had to present to the class uh, a, a, a project on neck dissection. Well, at that time, there was no, uh, no opportunity to get to Google search, etc., etc. So I got Hayes Martin's book, uh, Head and Neck Anatomy, in the, uh, anatomy, in the uh, library. Went through this, gave a lovely presentation, and totally fell in love with anatomy at that time. When I finished medical school, I was fortunate to, uh, uh, to come to the University of Western Ontario, London, Ontario, where I matched for the uh, straight in surgery in 1970. And uh, I, at that time, met many people who clearly influenced my career, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them momentarily. And uh, I um, uh, did my first year in general surgery. The second was a mixture of general surgery but I got an opportunity to do a lot of head and neck, or at least say head and neck, and it was a little bit, uh, uh, it wasn't as sophisticated as the head and neck is today. But I saw parotid tumors, thyroid surgery, etc., etc. But during the course of my residency, I saw a lot of uh, patients whom we do major pharyngeal resections on, and they would leak. And in particular, there was one patient uh, that uh, had a fistula, and he was hospitalized for just over 18 months. And it was, that, it was that case which really stimulated me to say, we need to be able to do this better. As a result, I had a desire to make changes, affect changes, and uh, to try to reconstruct people, try to do it better. And that's what really stimulated me to go into head and neck oncology, a combination of anatomy, my previous exposure to this parotid, the opportunity to potentially get back to Ireland to this uh, position that I it was uh, was offered, and uh, finally, but not least, the patient population, the head and neck and patient population, I enjoyed them very much. So a combination of all of the above, I think, resulted in my selecting uh, otolaryngology head and neck surgery. I had um, uh, I had a lot of reservations about which specialty was the best. I loved uh, plastics. I loved general surgery. But I thought that uh, the future was Odo head and neck. And at that time, it was just ENT. Today, we're, our specialty is otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. I selected that, and fortunately, I did. And when I finished uh, my residency, I was fortunate to have been selected to a, to a fellowship at that time. There was no match program uh, with Sebastian Arena in Pittsburgh, who had been a previous fellow of Dr. John Conley, that most of you in the society know incredibly well, one of our founding fathers, our first president, etc. And uh, Sebastian took me under his uh, wing. I spent the year 75, 76 in Pittsburgh with him. And then uh, fortunately during that time, Sebastian Arena took care of one of Dr. John Conley's uh, uh, aunts in Pittsburgh. And on a Sunday morning I'm doing rounds at about 7 o'clock, because at that time you work seven days a week. And uh, this tall man arrived on the floor and he said, I'm looking for Mrs. Sonso. And I recognized this face and I went over to him and I didn't realize she'd been related to him. And I said, I'm Dr. Arena's fellow. And he said, oh, you sound Irish. I said, well, I'm Canadian Irish. And uh, he said, uh, are you doing head and neck? I said, yeah, I'm Sebastian's uh, fellow. Show me my aunt. So I went and showed him the aunt and had a coffee with him after that. And about a month later, I met him in um, Miami, and I said, Dr. Conley, I applied for your fellowship on two occasions in 1974 and 75, never heard from you, and was rejected, I think, in the fourth letter. Is there any opportunity? And he turned to me, he said, I have 13 young doctors, he said, that uh, would like to be my fellow next year. I've never taken an Irishman. My great grandfather was born in Ireland. He said, I'm going to give this a chance, and I'm going to take you. So he called uh, Sebastian that night and 
Sebastian, the next day when I arrived back to Miami, said, oh, you've been talking to Dr. Connolly. He says, yeah. He said, I gave you a good reference. You'll be his fellow probably next year. So that's what me, got me uh, to where I am probably today, because he was probably one of the greatest people I think I ever trained with John and uh, was a remarkable teacher. But I'm also uh, grateful to uh, Sebastian Arena, who took the chance and this young Irishman from London, Ontario, he didn't even know where London, Ontario was, and he said, okay, come and work with me. So that was it. Well, Pat, I've known you for 25 years and the uh, name Sebastian Arena has come up before, but the name that has probably come up more than any other as far as a mentor goes is the name that uh, you just mentioned, John Conley. So uh, I thought we'd spend some time talking about John because uh, he is not a mentor, obviously, that I knew, but I knew him through you. And uh, so I feel, in fact, that I've done a fellowship with, in some ways, John Conley. Uh, so um, what about John Conley inspired you? And perhaps you can give us a story or two, some anecdotes about John Conley. Well, from the first time I met Dr. Conley, he really, he changed my attitude towards head and neck uh, surgery. Uh, John was incredibly passionate. He just turned 65 years of age when I was his fellow. But right from the time I met him, John, <coughs> he, just, he just totally inspired me. He, he affected this change in me that I didn't know what was happening. And, and I have no idea to this day, John, uh, what was really happening to me. But he said, uh, where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? And I said to him, I said, Dr. Conley, yeah, I'd like to be like you. And he said, well, therefore, Pat, you've got a lot of work to do. So he <laughs> inspired me. And he uh, worked, you know, five, six, seven days a week. But he also had some pastimes, like uh, he liked to walk, he, liked to, uh, he loved music, he loved poetry, as you know, and he wrote uh, uh, about seven or eight uh, volumes of poetry. But it was really his, his, his effectiveness on me, his teaching, his inspiration to publish your results. And I'll never forget one thing that he said, John, for every one wonderful paper uh, you publish, Pat, do have 10 quickies because you know you have to pad your CV a little bit and he said don't forget also work with other people and it was that probably team approach that uh, had an impact on my career John that I think that uh, John Conley said if you want to do it you got to work hard if you want to do it you've got to publish and if you want to do it and to be a leader you have to communicate the word he would say to me, I'm sure once a week, he who can communicate will be a leader. And I think to this day, John, I'll never forget it. Uh, so he was a teacher, he was a leader, he was an, educa uh, sorry, an educator, he was an innovator, and he had a great mind to, uh, to, uh, um, to, to make things happen, to make, to, to make things happen. I think that was it. Yeah, good. And do you have any stories about him? Well, I think well, I was about uh, six weeks as his fellow, and uh, he, uh, he said, let's go to Boston to this meeting. He said, uh, you haven't a paper as yet, Pat, but uh, I'll put your name on this paper so long as you finish it tomorrow night and this weekend, and I did. And it was called the, the Masseter Muscle Flap. I'll never forget it. And we um, got on the flight on the Friday afternoon after being in the operating room, and uh, we got into Boston, we flew Eastern Airlines, and uh, shared the room with John. John, uh, John was not one of those people that threw his money away. And uh, we shared a room. My God, I woke up at about 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and he was sitting up in his bed, and he was going through his slides and going through his presentation. I think that had an incredible effect on me, John. I think that I felt that a man so preeminent in our society, so well known globally, that he was practicing his presentation at 4:30 in the morning, when I had just when I woke up, mm. that had an, a profound effect right. in my career. Yeah. Uh, that was number one. Uh, number two, 
uh, he operated on a lot of prominent people, and I was uh, blessed to meet so many preeminent people during that year. I found them all wonderful people, but in particular one who is quite well known to the United States. Uh, we operated on this individual, and I removed this individual's sutures in uh, this person's home about 10 days later at his request, and this person didn't want to come back to the office, and two weeks later I went back to make sure everything had healed okay, and he wanted to know if it, this person had, and I said, everything's good. And I said, uh, about a week later, I said, oh, Dr. Conley, this person invited me for dinner on Saturday night. Wasn't that so nice? And I thought I was telling them something that was, you know, would, that we'd be proud of, et cetera, et cetera. He was actually very annoyed that he was not enjo inv <laughs> invited to this, to this uh, lovely dinner to this person's home. So it was one of the things that I found that, uh, you know, people in preeminent positions can feel a uh, little uh, left out at times. So uh, right. he did. Good. Good story. So, Pat, let's move from people and to practice. Yep. So you've been around a long time. You have uh, probably had a, a, a career now, uh, now that's uh, over four decades. That's correct, yeah. Um, what's changed? So if you think of 40 years ago in head and neck surgery or in oncology, um, how is it so different today? I think that the, uh, I know that while much of the science we've do, done has had impact. I think uh, some of the molecular markers has impact. If I'm to think of one thing that probably has provided us the opportunity to do things that we're doing today in head and neck has been the better forms of reconstruction. And I think it has uh, helped to diminish the morbidity, uh, improve survival. For example, in skull-based surgery, John published one of the first page papers in North America on skull-based surgery, 77 cases of skull-based surgery uh, that uh, we did here at the University of Toronto. He was the first author. And uh, in that paper, we, we showed an improved survival from the old 15% to 54% at three years and 52% at five years. John, that had a profound effect on me. It really, really did. And that paper is, as you know, uh, cited today in almost every publication uh, in North America or in the world. That paper had a profound effect on me and I think that it was the approaches, the teamwork and the better reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we showed in that paper and following papers that uh, free tissue transfer, we use it in the skull base, etc. to diminish the incidence of abscesses, meningitis uh, and uh, CSF leaks. Because in that paper, we had an incidence of about 8% of CSF leaks, or 10%. Uh, complications, 44%, 42-44%. And we have diminished the complication rate. So I think that that's certainly better reconstruction, better approaches. But one of the things that I see is the better technology. Uh, technology, more talent in our profession, and more tolerance in our profession. I think technology, talent, and tolerance. We have been able to recruit the brightest and the best. John, you're one of the brightest and the best in our specialty. You've been recognized as, as the uh, Conley lecturer. You're the incoming president of the American Head and Neck Society. And it's like having a son that's been successful. Uh, you have been such a success that uh, I'm so proud of you. So I think you have shown that technology has ma is making great impact we're attracting the brightest and best people, as I've said, uh, the best talent. And I think we're all tolerating this a little bit. So I've seen incredible changes, uh, minimal access approaches, and now the better molecular markers, which you've been involved in. But it hasn't had as great an impact as the reconstruction and the technology. Yeah, fair. Okay, so let's move from change over 40 years to s things that haven't changed. So what hasn't changed? very much over 40 years. What is, you go into the office or in the operating room every day, what seems to be the same? We continue to struggle 40 years later with budgets. <laughs> I honestly think that uh, uh, we've all, and uh, we've all gone after funds, etc. Maybe I'll mention that momentarily, but uh, I think as I come to the office 
40 years later, John, the, you as the provincial head, you as the head of surgical oncology, just stepped down from that position. Uh, my other colleague, Ralph Gilbert, is our uh, uh, chief. I hear it every day. We need more money. Budget is an issue. I think that that is the one thing that has not changed. We've been able to change surgery the way we do it, uh, being able to recruit great people, great minds. We have labs, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the budget. Interesting. So what's your solution? Philanthropy. <laughs> I think that uh, philanthropy is the solution. And I think that we've got to continue to uh, impress on our patients and our more wealthy patients that they've got to contribute if they want to be able to continue to have a superior healthcare system than we have in Canada. Uh, we're fortunate. I have been to 102 of the countries in the world and uh, without a doubt, uh, even I'm speaking to an American society and has past president of the society, I think we have a unique healthcare system. I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue to fund it. Uh, and uh, uh, if so, we'll continue to be able to care for the people of Canada. Great. So, um, change, no change. What's the uh, biggest current threat do you think we have to our specialty in uh, head and neck surgery um, and perhaps in medicine as well? Let's take both. I think, I think to continue to be able to attract, number one, but to retain talent. Uh, I think one of the weaknesses in Canada is that we've been able to attract some wonderful people who have made incredible changes in our specialty, in other specialties. I'll take lung transplant. Uh, the two people who pioneered the lung transplant moved to the south of us. Many of our, uh, our uh, Canadian uh, uh, singers, uh, our Canadian poets, our Canadian entrepreneurs have moved south. And it is how do we, how can we put in place a, uh, an environment that will keep them in Canada? We have incredible people, we've got great, uh, uh, great uh, entrepreneurs, uh, but it's, we're having a hard time trying to retain them. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the real challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's one of the things that I've mentioned to some of our, uh, to some of our uh, uh, members of parliament in the last uh, year, and I've said, is there any way we can create that environment? And we're doing that, I mm -hmm. think, with MARS within the University Health Network, the foundations within the Princess Margaret Hospital, departments are putting more money into recruiting the brightest and the best people, and uh, I think that that is one of the things that we have going to have to protect. Mm -hmm and the, the leaders in our fields, not alone just head and neck, but in auto head and neck, plastics, any of the surgical specialties, medical specialties, is how we retain those mm -hmm. people. So I think philanthropy is it. And what do you think our greatest opportunity is looking forward? Looking forward to the vision in five and 10 years, what's our greatest opportunity that we have in our specialty in the care of our head and neck cancer patients? We have great people like you, John. Um, and, and that is true because uh, John's interest is in technology uh, and I think that the greatest opportunity is to improve technology. As we can see, we're all becoming much more innovative, more minimal access approaches. It's technology, technology, technology. I, uh, I feel uh, a little saddened that I, I won't uh, be around in five or ten years to be able to to uh, to utilize the technology and the approaches that you'll be able to and the things that you'll be able to do uh, in five years I think will be unique and so it's technology as far as I'm concerned and also how the, I think the other thing the other challenge we have is to continue to be able to recruit the best in medical school mm -hmm. good so our last question um, a lot of uh, young uh, otolaryngologists, new to our field, residents, fellows, medical students will look at this interview and uh, what would you impart, what would be words of wisdom that you would give to someone young in their career uh, to make their 
experience better. What words I, of wisdom would you give to someone just starting out? If you, I think if you dream it, like I did, I had a dream. And if you dream it, I think you can achieve it. And if you work on it, you can make it do. And you can, uh, you can, uh, you, you can make it do. So that would be what I think. And uh, uh, looking into the future, uh, I think that uh, to uh, younger people, get the best education possible. Um, go get the best training, give it as much as you can and work at it and try to have a goal of one or two or three areas, not just one specific area. So like you've done with head and neck, uh, for them to focus on one area. I think that's it. And if they dream it, they can achieve it. Pat, uh, as always, um, when, when I'm given a list of 15 questions to ask you, I only have to ask about three or four because you basically fill in the rest. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> Thank you so much.